Hello everyone who's watching and has tuned in to this session slash webinar. My name is Amin and I'm really presenting to both the parents and the students out there who are thinking about applying to a Russell Group University. This is really aimed at the ambitious students who want to get to a top university, but also the parents who want to help their child and push them. I've added loads and loads of valuable content into the sort of timeline you should be expecting in terms of your application process, both again, both for parents and students, loads of value into what you can be doing to help your child. And then on the other side, loads and loads of support for students who want to understand how they can revise better, how they can study better, and how they can guarantee themselves uh, really, really good grades that will get them into their target university. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce myself a bit more properly. My name is Amin, as I mentioned, and I actually was an ex-head boy at Heston uh, around five years ago. When I was at Heston, I did my GCSEs. Um, I got seven A stars and four A's. I, I did my A levels and got pretty good results there too. And then I went over to do physics at Imperial, um, where I graduated a couple of years ago. Since going to Imperial, I've done a student investment banking. I was at sales for a startup. I'm currently a product manager for a health alternative company. And I run my own business on the side throughout this whole period. Um, the slides really to show you that I have some sort of credentials behind me. I'm not just uh, making this all up as I go along. But also to show you, maybe to the parents out there, sort of a first hint that the sort of world of work is changing. Um, once when you would sort of have a company you worked for, you'd stay for 10 to 15 years and sort of rise up it. We're now seeing a sort of new generation of workers who, who come into jobs, do it for a couple of years and then move around quite a bit. Now, this is even more prominent when you're first graduating and coming out of university. So unless you're applying for a very specific uh, career, such as being a doctor or a lawyer, um, there's a lot more variability in your career, which, which is something to expect, but something also to really look forward to. Now, if we sort of fast rewind back, say, six or seven years, I was studying for my GCSE exams. When I completed my GCSEs, I achieved seven A stars and four A's. Um, but more specifically, in 13 exams, I achieved 100%. Interestingly, the same thing happened again in my A-levels, where I achieved three A stars overall in total, but again, in 13 exams, I achieved 100%. Now, the reason why I got 100% in overall 26 exams is really what I attribute down to the method I was using, uh, the technique, and how to revise. I was studying smart. I was studying often, um, being very clever about how I spent my time. And, and that's really what I attribute down to getting 100% in certain exams. Now, after I did the exams and, and so forth, I applied for university where I was offers from Imperial, King's, UCL, Bath, all for physics and a rejection from Oxford. And I eventually went to study at Imperial. And so the sort of purpose of this presentation, I'd say, is to go into uh, two sections, sort of succeeding exams. And I'm going to give you a bit more advice on how I did what I did in my GCSE and A levels, how I how I revise the techniques I used, and also how much studying I did. And then the second part, which I haven't touched on yet, is around how to write a compelling personal statement. Um, and the sub-points there are work experience or reading. We'll go into that a bit more detail, but it's really surrounding how to, how to write that statement, how to gather the right experiences in the prior years, so you put yourself in a really good situation when you do have to write that, that personal statement. So this is part one of, of one, I guess, um, and, and the answer to the age-old question, how much was I studying outside of school? Um, I'm really trying to give you a transparent and honest answer here, and it will be the probably shortest section of this whole presentation. So I was doing around two to four hours after school every day, which I then added uh, with an additional four to six hours on the weekend, which, which adds up over the couple of days. But then very quickly, 
becomes 18 on the lower end and then 32 on the higher end per week. Now, if you take that number of weeks you have at university, sorry, at, at, at school, preparing for university even, which is only six, 36 weeks, it's considerably smaller than you'd think. Um, you're only looking at around 700 to 1,200 hours, which is a fairly small number in, in all honesty. Um, the way you can use this information is to benchmark yourself or to hold yourself accountable. You can say, I know how much I'm doing, I need to be doing more, or I need to be doing less. Um, and for parents, there's also, again, another benchmark, some more information to have. So the way you see it is you just think, how many hours do you do a week? 18 to around 32. It's, as long as you're in that ballpark, I think you're, you're doing a good job um, and, you're on the, and you're on a good track. So the first bit, super transparent. Uh, again, 18 to 32 hours is what you need to be thinking in your head per week. Um, but the second bit, I, I really do think there's a load of value in there. And it's how I got the grades I got, what technique I used um, and have been using for the last eight years. So this revision technique that I used um, was really helpful. It got me 100% in my exams. And it's really what I attributed to, to the sort of grades I was achieving at, at school. Um, I started to use this technique around two months before the start of a GCSE exam and then three months before the start of an A-level exam. And again, A-level because there's just a bit more content, you just need a bit more time to get through the syllabus. Uh, I spent uh, approximately, say, £200, um, and again, that's like a rough estimate. Uh, and that's really just showed like an incredible ROI for what you're getting. When you go to when you go to university, you basically end up increasing your lifetime expected earnings by a considerable amount. And so anything you can do to get yourself to a better university has a huge compounding and knock-on effect for the rest of your life, really. And, and as you know, I started this in GCSEs. I, I then went to using A-levels, and it was working really well. So much so, I continued and I used it in university. And then I even noticed people were copying me that they were using the same technique. And this actually happened in A-levels and GCSE as well. And I think it does show the power of what I was doing and, and how much sort of awareness people were, were seeing about what I was doing and, and how effective it can be. And really has been picked up by anyone that's tried it, has done well, really well at it. And if they've given it the full, full go. So I've made you wait so around like seven and a half minutes for the technique and it's um, this is it. It's, it's flashcard Q&A or question and answer. And what I do is I'd, I'd, I'd take some flashcards and I'd on one side write the question down and on the other side I'd write the answer down to that question. So I'd flip the card over and there'd be both sides written on. Uh, and questions could be really simple. They could be why does, I don't know, what's the capital of, of England? It could be answer could be London. Or it can be a bit more complicated, saying why does the ammonia produced in the harbour cycle or process not all turn back into nitrogen and hydrogen? And the answer, which I checked from exam solutions and also checked uh, in the syllabus and then also in the book, would be the standard answer. The gases do not stay long enough in the reactor to reach equilibrium. And I did this for every page in every book, in every chapter, um, in every module, for every subject for the whole year. And, and that's what really helped me memorize and, and get to grip with all the material in the syllabus. So this is what I basically did. I, I went to Ryman's and I spent £2.99 on a pack of 100 flashcards. Uh, I'd write a question on one side. So I'd go into the, the George Facer A2 Chemistry and Excel book. And I'd write the question, um, what's the harbour process? Or I'd write, like, what's, how do I draw the structure of a benzene ring, for example? And then I'd write the answer on the other hand. And then I'd write down every single question I could think of on that page, on that topic. Um, very similar to how if you ask someone to test you on a, on a, on a page in a book, for example, you'd ask them lots of questions. Um, you're just doing that for yourself, but then writing all those questions down. I even went even further, right? Whenever I saw a new exam question, which I didn't know, I'd also write that down and add it into the pile. Whenever I heard a new question at school or in class, I'd again make a note of the question, write it down and add it into the pile. And so what you end up doing is creating this really personalized and huge bank of questions 
um, that you can ask about the topic. And if you do it well enough, you basically have every question the exam can ask you. And so when I sat some exams, um, nothing surprised me. I, I finished early half the time. I knew exactly what the question was asking for, and I knew exactly what the answer was, because when I'd written the answer down, I'd also written it, I'd checked it with the syllabus, I'd checked it with any sort of exam paper solutions, historical ones, so I knew exactly what the exam was looking for. And in all honesty, that's what the exam is, te is sort of testing you on. It's teaching, or testing you on your retention, so how much memory can you retain and bring back into the moment, but also how you can apply the information. So obviously the way you write your question might not be the exact way you hear it in the exam. But if you can make that connection, uh, you're in a really, really good situation. So I really want to really bring this back and just show you again what this looks like. It's simply a question on one side and an answer on the other side. Um, it can be as simple as a most basic definition question. Uh, define. It could be a state question, state the equation for. It could be a describe question, so describe something, or it can even be evaluate, um, and we're slowly working up that, that hierarchy of the types of questions you can get asked in the exam, from, from simple to complex. And you can write all those questions on the flashcard. I did this technique at university, I did it at GCC, I did it at A level. It, it really works across any sort of level, as long as you're able to distinguish bits of, of text and you can separate the questions and how, how you think you can get through them in a flashcard. Now this is like a really honest slide again. This is like a picture of, I'd say, a third of all the flashcards I've had over the last eight years. Um, each of those like big colourful envelopes fits around, I'd say, nine to twelve of these like paper envelope plaques, uh, packs of flashcards, which again have between 100 and 200 cards. Um, so I'd pick a pack out or a topic that I haven't done for a little bit of time and then I'd start and I'd read the question and I'd answer it out in my head or out loud um, and I'd be really honest with myself and turn it over and look at the answer. Uh, and I'd honestly say to myself if I got it right or wrong I'd correct myself in my head again or I'd correct myself on paper by writing it down. That mainly proved a bit more effective for me. Um, I then need to add it to a done pile. Sometimes I'd even add it to like a separate part of like questions I got wrong. Just like I want to go over these like bunch of questions I got wrong again and again and again until I get them right. And sort of increase that neuron pathway strength, increase the retention there uh, and drive my memory. And as I mentioned, I'd make a note of anything I got wrong and I'd repeat it. Um, and the really cool thing about this is I used to do this um, when I was at university on my in the tube in to uni. Um, when I was going to school sometimes walking in, I'd just do a little pack very quickly. Um, I could get through maybe a few packs a day, so I could do maybe a whole, a few modules from different subjects. So it's super versatile, it's on your hand, and you, you're you gaining memory and, and application of knowledge in two ways. The first way is that you're writing all this information down, so you're actively engaging with the material. And then the second way is you're testing yourself and you're going over it again and again and again. Now this isn't like some hocus pocus stuff. This was a thing and it's a really well known researched bit of evidence. And this is what's probably the most frustrating thing about um, how people tell you to revise and how people revise, it's always wrong. Um, in 2013, the BBC released this article and they said, okay, how do you do it? The good, the bad, the useless. Um, and there's one paper, someone did a research paper about this um, who was quoted in, Again, uh, the BBC is creating like Edinburgh's university's website about how to revise, and it says writing summaries, reading through notes and essays is a waste of your time. Um, and I'm sorry that everyone that does that, it's just not that useful. Um, if you reread stuff, again, it's not doing anything because you're just superficially touching that knowledge. But the the main thing that he says that the main two parts of this te this technique and the paper, it goes, if you self-test yourself, if you spread your learning over time, um, i.e. you review material after a gap of time, so you take a day and you do the flashcard the day after, that's really valuable. Um, so in this, in this BBC article, they, they wrote down all these techniques they used and they did a really bad job of <laughs> putting them in order of uh, low to high, so I'll try to do this myself. So there's 10 techniques that this study went through. Um, for example, the second one says self-explanation. So if you 
if you teach yourself or you learn by explaining to yourself how a problem was solved or how something was done, it's a, it's a decent technique. But there's like low ones which are like sort of useless, I guess, to memory. Um, summarizing, writing summaries of text, not that useful. If you're highlighting or underlining, super, super useless. Um, keyword mnemonics, um, this one I sort of disagree with. If you choose a word to associate with information, so sometimes you'll see like a, um, an acronyms and phrases, they can actually be really useful if you're just trying to memorize very small bits of information, but a whole module, not useful. Um, imagery, um, not super useful. Rereading, again, it's, it's, it's not great. If I move forward, you can like, pick up the ones that are moderate, i.e. These are, these are decent ways to revise. And if you I do elaborative interrogation or self-explanation. So those first two is like ways of teaching yourself of anything. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but if you, if you teach someone something, you feel like you understand it better, um, or it's a good sign that you understand it. And that's really this second, this middle technique. Um, so you're doing it and you, you know it works, but you've never been shown it in this light. Uh, and the last bit, someone says interleaved practice. So if you switch between modules very often or types of problems, um, everyone always says, yeah, I'll take a break, change the topic you're doing. It's actually self-proven that it's really useful. You shouldn't do one subject for the whole day. You should really split it up into a few different uh, chapters. But the ones that have really proved out to be really well is practice testing and distributed practice. So self-testing check knowledge, especially using flashcards and spreading out study over time. Hi. Uh, I don't know how to make it more clear. It's, these are like scientifically proven techniques that work. And if you're doing them, you're, you're putting yourself at the best advantage. And if you're doing those red ones, you're not. Um, the, the person led the research went even to say, like, if you read the book, make the flashcards and test yourself. Um, and a century of research has shown that this works and you just need to apply it and we need to do it again and again and again. So that was the first half of the presentation where I told you how much revision, how much studying should you be doing per week, which again, 18 to 32 hours. And then I told you the revision technique that I used and I was super honest and super transparent about what I think about other techniques. Um, and maybe this is a good point to claim, maybe I'm wrong, maybe that technique does work for you. Um, and if so, and you've proven it to yourself that it works, um, then go ahead. But I'd really recommend you give this method a try out. Um, sort of scientifically proven to, to help you retain more information and eventually to achieve better as well. Now the second part of this, this whole presentation is talking about your personal statement. Um, and parents, I'm, I'm now bringing it back to you again. I've sort of told your students, so your children, how to revise better. And now again, it's for you and, and how, to, how to write that compelling personal statement, what you need to be doing uh, to support their growth there. So this is a, a timeline of how you need to be thinking about the, the coming year. So we're currently in October 2020, we're on that left side of the line. Um, and in January this year, your, your child has a mock exams, uh, or you have mock exams, if I'm talking to you. Um, you get some sort of predictions from that in May, um, based on your mock exams and based on how you've been doing in school. And then you have that summer between May and October to write this personal statement, um, which will be used to determine whether you should get into or not into a certain university. When you think about it, it's kind of it's kind of crazy the amount of time that you, you sort of don't have. Um, you're you're starting university in 2022, but you now have to start thinking about the choices you need to make in 2020 uh, to put yourself in the right position that you can write an amazing personal statement that you can get high grades in your mocks. So again, parents like that giant mark is they need to be revising, they need to be studying hard to prove themselves in their mock from October to January. That's three months to prove yourself. Um, that second, that second bullet, that second February 2021, the uh, work experience that I'm going to talk about now. So maybe from October to January, when I was again um, applying for university, I was going to loads of taster courses. Um, these are when you can go to the university and you can actually um, sit in a lecture hall for a day and, and try out the course and meet the, the lecturers. Um, I don't know how that's not work with COVID right now, but it was a super valuable experience. And I imagine there's gonna be some sort of online version of it. 
um, because universities do gain a lot of value out of it too. At the same time, applying for work experience, um, in my personal statement, which again happens on the right hand side of that graph, I am writing a A4 page to a university telling them why I want to study the subject that I want to study. So for example, in my physics personal statement, I discussed I want to study physics because I want to understand how things work. Um, and I proved my interest to the admissions tutor or to the university I was applying by showing them that I had taken the time out of my day and the effort to apply for work experience to be successful in my application, to go to guest lectures, to go to London to see a museum, to listen to podcasts, um, to do extra courses. I'm proving time and time again to my admissions tutor that I am worth the risk of giving a space to me because I'm going to stay the full four years. I'm going to give them the full amount of money um, and it's going to be an amazing experience. So in that first maybe from October now, you should really be thinking about applying for work experience in, in the place you want to go. If, you're, if you want to go to medicine, you need to get work experience in the hospital and you're going to need to prove that you, you know what you're getting yourself into. Um, at the same time, you might also be doing extra curricular courses. So these are like online courses. Um, you'll be reading books about what you're interested in. I, I was tutoring a, a girl that got into Oxford recently who goes to Tiffin School and she... Um, Without actually doing it for a personal statement, she was writing a blog every week um, about some cool biological animal that she found and drawing sketches and talking about really cool parts of her anatomy. And that's something that she found interesting. And, and to the admission student in Oxford, that, that was amazing. It just showed a real passion and interest for the subject. So if you don't have that passion yet, that's fine. It's something that you need to develop, but you need to start doing that. Um, I'd say hold off on any lectures until the summer um, because it's a lot more quieter then. Uh, in the summer, you're basically at home, writing the personal statement, using all the experiences that you've set up for yourself at the beginning part of the year where you've applied for things, um, which generally happen in either April, um, in the spring half terms, or they happen in the summer half terms. So if I don't apply for work experience by February 2021, I've more or less missed out. There's no more trees left. Um, everything has sort of been applied for, everyone's competed for their place and it's going to be very difficult to find work experience. So it's really important you do that before and again you need to be thinking about that now. And again this is not information you can get from everyone, this doesn't, no one knows about this to an extent, parents, teachers do, but they have 101 other things to communicate to your child which is uh, getting them time to understand the course material and hence why I'm here trying to tell you uh, this is a super important part to think about. So I, I think I was once asked in a previous presentation I did uh, two years ago, and I did the same presentation, uh, I'll be a bit changed. Um, how do you get work experience? And I think the best way to think about it is you have to make your own opportunities. Um, now parents, you've all <laughs> applied for jobs and you know you have to put yourself out there a bit. And it's the same thing here. When I was in, when I was 16 years old, I guess, so maybe uh, year 11, year 12, I was applying for loads of little schemes and things I could do. Um, I was applying to the F1, <laughs> um, to the Great Ormond Street Hospital, um, going to taster courses, applying to radiology departments in hospitals, even though I had no right to be there really. Um, applying to like law firms just for the sake of getting into the door and seeing who I can talk to. And eventually opportunities start coming back to you. And the more you chuck out, the better, the more lucky you get. So then I ended up getting a work experience at Imperial itself. So when I went to apply to Imperial, uh, they already actually knew who I was and it made my application so much easier. So it, there is really a lot of scope for you to, to make your own journey and, and to make your own experience here and make your own opportunities. And that, that final bit I sort of touched on in the in the timeline bit is about developing an interest beyond the curriculum. And, and parents, this is where you come in as well. You need to be Asking your child what they've done, what they've read recently, what podcasts have they listened to. Um, for physics, I did all these little things. I read a couple, a few books, I listened to a podcast, went to a couple of public lectures um, and played some sports. Um, and sports are really cool because it shows, again, that you're a well-rounded individual. So... In sort of summary, I'd say there's like three really big factors that help you get accepted into university. Um, the first is like getting good grades. 
and it's something I touched on right at the beginning about the technique I was using, the time I was putting in. The second bit is about preparing early, um, and that's the timeline that I showed you earlier on. You need to apply for work experiences, you need to read books, gain exposures, talk to people, um, talk to your teachers, they can help you out most definitely. But the third bit, which I haven't told you yet, is and I think it's so incredibly important, I just don't think it gets communicated enough, is the number of people you show your personal statement to. Um, if you have one A4 document that might determine the course of your future, I think you'd be pretty certain you want to make sure there's no spelling errors in there. Um, and every person you show it to might disagree with the previous person about what they think it should read like. Um, but every person you see it to gets your new opinion and new point of view. So I think I showed it to six teachers that I trusted or that I thought were going to be able to help me or that knew the area that I was applying to. Um, I reached out to ex Heston students and a couple of them were super, super friendly to me and helped me out with my application. And they gave me some really inside knowledge to how university life is. And then I had my family and my brother who I love to show stuff with. And I put 10 of my friends, I don't know what the exact number was, but I was super honest and open about showing my past statement to anyone who wanted to look at it. Um, and in return, I get to look at this, I guess, and I get to, we get to compare and we get to both learn from that experience. Um, there really is like no way to like sort of be, be selfish about this or, or not share opportunities with other people. Um, the more you share, the more you get in return, I guess, as well. Um, so be open about it. Show this is what I did. This is what I like. Can you give me any tips or techniques? And that's really how you're going to succeed um, into getting into a Russell Group University.